Again, turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13. We are concluding our four-week series entitled, We Are the Church, and we've been answering the important question through these four weeks, what is the purpose of the local church? Too many times, as we've talked about in the American church culture, the church has become too often a place where we're focused on ourselves. In other words, in the American church, all too often, we kind of succumb to the cancer of consumerism that is at the heart of so much of what drives our culture. And instead of being agents of change in the culture, too often the American church has allowed the culture to change us. And that's often seen in the way that the church becomes all about me or all about you, about about meeting my needs, about meeting my preferences. But we've been challenged as we've opened up the Word of God to be reminded that the church is actually called to be on mission, to be outward focused. We've talked about what it means over the last few weeks to be called to be a place where we serve, that we're called to be a place where we connect with one another, that as the church we're called to be a place where we care for one another And then finally this morning, we're going to conclude this series by seeing what the Bible has to say about being on mission for God's kingdom as the local church. The big idea this morning is this, that every believer has been given a mission by God in the church, and that mission is twofold, to seek the kingdom of God in our own lives and then share the kingdom of God by reaching out to the lost. And the the reality is when we have this type of focused missional mindset, we can't help but to not be self-focused or self-centered. We will be outward focused. We will be other centered. And so this morning we're going to talk about what it means to be focused on mission for God. This morning I want us to look at what are two of my favorite, and really by favorite I mean most personally challenging um, parables in Scripture. There are two very short ones. Some people consider these one par- this one parable with two parts, however you want to look at it. But these parables, starting in Matthew 13, verse 44, are challenging because I think in so many ways they're the ultimate picture of what it means to be focused on mission, to seek the kingdom and then to share the kingdom with others. Jesus says, starting in verse 44, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then his joy, in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Isn't that powerful? The focus that Jesus is describing these two men who sought after his kingdom. Reminds me of an interview that I read a couple of weeks ago. It was an excerpt of an old interview from a magazine over a hundred years ago uh, where they interviewed Thomas Edison, the great inventor. And listen to the focus that Thomas Edison had on his mission to invent certain things. The interviewer asked the question, what's the first requisite for success? And Edison said, the ability to apply your physical and mental energies to one problem incessantly. You do something all day long, don't you? If you get up at 7 and go to bed at 11, you have put in 16 good hours. And it is certain with most men that they have been doing something all the time. The only trouble is that they do it about a great many things. And I, Edison said, do it about one. If they applied it all in one direction as I do, they too would succeed." Isn't that a great picture of focus, of being on mission? And our challenge as the church, as we seek the kingdom of God individually, and then as we seek to share the kingdom of God, the good news of the gospel with others, the challenge is that we don't lose focus. It is so easy in this culture that causes us to be so busy 
It's so easy with these self-centered, sinful hearts of ours to instead of being on mission and focused on what God's called us to be, we become self-centered and focused on what we want. We lose our focus on the mission. It reminds me of an older man who was considering buying a house in the neighborhood right by a junior high school. And all of his friends said, oh, you don't want to buy the house there. Those kids before and after school are so loud. They walk up and down the street. They bang on the trash cans. They tip the trash cans over. You'll hate living there. Well, the old man decided that he was going to buy the house anyway. And for the first few weeks that he lived there before school started, it was all fine and quiet. But then the school year started. And that first morning of the school year, a group of boys walked up his street. And sure enough, they banged on the trash cans. They tipped them over, just made a basic mess of things. And then on their way home after school was over, they did the same thing. They banged on the cans, pushed the cans over. Well, the man, instead of becoming disheartened, decided that he would do his best to help them lose their focus on what they were doing. And so the next day, as the boys were going to school, he met them outside and he said, boys, I love your energy. I love your enthusiasm. A matter of fact, I'm going to give you one dollar for every can of mine that you can knock over. Well, the boys looked at him like he was crazy, but they took him up on the offer, knocked his cans over, banged on him. He paid them a dollar each for each can, and they went on their way. They did this for two or three days before school and after school. Well, about the fourth day, the man went out and with a little bit of a look of embarrassment on his face said, boys, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this, but the economy is bad. I'm only going to be able to pay you 50 cents per can that you knock over. Well, the boys kind of looked at each other and said, well, it's better than nothing. And so for the next few days, they bang on the cans, knock them over. And sure enough, the man gave him 50 cents. Well, about a week after that, he came out with a really a forlorn look on his face and said, boys, my social security check isn't everything that I thought it would be. To be honest with you, I can only pay you a quarter per can to knock them over. And the boys looked at each other and the spokesman of the group said, a quarter a can? That's not worth our time. We quit. And they walked off and never messed with his cans again. <laughs> Isn't that a picture of how culture can slip in to our mission and our purpose, cause us to be distracted and often say, oh, it's not worth it. I'm going to go do something else. Well, this morning as we think about these parables, and I love these parables, they are a challenge to us to stay on mission, to seek the kingdom of God and share the kingdom of God. First of all, we see this. We see the discovery. I love the discovery moment in these parables. Jesus says again at the beginning of each parable, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And then the other one, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And we see that he found this merchant one of great value. Don't you love how Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven here, the kingdom of God, the truth of our salvation, the truth that Jesus has come? We speak of the kingdom of God as being the rule and reign in the hearts and the minds of, of men and women, boys and girls. In a very real sense, we, we have the kingdom of God dwelling in us and we dwell in the kingdom of God. We also recognize that the kingdom of God is something yet fulfilled, that when Jesus comes back, he's going to consummate his kingdom. And so at the second coming of Jesus, we'll fully experience the kingdom of God. But in a very here and now sense, the kingdom of God is also the salvation that we experience, the reconciliation that we have with God through Jesus. And so when, when Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God as a treasure, he's expressing the great value that our salvation, our relationship, the gospel, the truth of Jesus' reign in our hearts, he's expressing the value that it has. Now, this first parable, the idea of a man walking in a field and finding a treasure is something that Jesus' immediate hearers would have immediately understood. 
There were no banks. There were very few places in Jesus' day in those cultures where you could take your money or especially your, your valuables for safekeeping. And so it was very typical for someone who had something, a treasure of great value, to go out in a field and to basically dig a hole, put the treasure in, bury it over as well as he could, And then if the person needed the money or needed some of the resources, he would go out, hopefully remember where the hole was, dig out the treasure, take what he needed, put it back in, cover it back up, and then go about his way. And that worked fine unless, number one, you forgot where you buried your treasure, or number two, if you died. Now, of course, this is a parable. This is this is a, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So, of course, Jesus doesn't tell us, did the owner of the treasure die? Did he forget where it buried, he was buried? It doesn't matter. The point is, there was a man walking along, and he found, in the middle of his walk, this buried treasure. Jesus also compares the kingdom of God to the the treasure or the value of a pearl of great price. Now, this would also have been something that Jesus' hearers would have immediately understood. There were all across the ancient world those pearl merchants who basically hunted for pearls. Now, some people uh, literally risked their lives in the pursuit of these pearls. It was very dangerous. We think of diving now with scuba gear, but of course they didn't have anything like that. And it wasn't uncommon for someone to die or to really risk their health by diving and being a pearl merchant. Pearls were so treasured in the ancient world, they were considered actually an investment. The Egyptians and the Romans so valued pearls that pearls were actually in some ways used in their worship of false gods. And in some scholarship circles, historians believe maybe the pearls themselves were actually worshipped. So they were a valued gem. So Jesus is painting this picture. The kingdom of heaven, our salvation, the truth of the gospel, everything that's wrapped up in the kingdom of heaven in us is of such deep and abiding and great value. So it brings up an important and a a vital question for each of us as believers, not only individually, but as a church, and it's this. Do we treasure the kingdom of God like that? Do we as a church, do you as a believer, do I treasure the kingdom of God like that? Do we treasure the reality of our salvation like that? Do we treasure the working of God in our lives like that? Do we treasure the pursuit of the kingdom of God? Do we treasure the pursuit of a deeper relationship with Jesus like that? Now, the question that we might ask is, okay, what does that look like? If that is the discovery and we're called to treasure it, what does it look like for an individual or for a church to treasure the kingdom of God, the message of salvation, the gospel, the rule of Christ in our hearts. What does it look like for us to treasure it like that? And that brings us to the second point. We see the discovery, but then number two, we see the treasure itself. Look again at those those verses. What does Jesus say next? First of all, talking about the treasure, he says, when a man found it, he hid it again. And then here's the description. This is why this parable challenges me so much. And it says, and then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and bought the field. And then the the pearl merchant, it goes on to say, when he found one, meaning that pearl of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Don't miss the picture here. What does it mean to treasure the kingdom of God, the reality of our salvation? Well, in this parable, Jesus describes it as a man who is willing to sacrifice everything in order to to possess the treasure. What does that mean in our individual lives? If we are on mission to seek the kingdom of God, 
and then it be so valuable to us that we then share the kingdom of God, what does it look like to seek that treasure, to, to sell everything so that the treasure can be ours? Well, I think in our individual lives... It means that we treasure the kingdom of God and it is reflected in our willingness to sacrifice our pride for genuine worship. Or it will be reflected in our willingness to sacrifice our love and comfort for sin for a life of holiness at work or at school or in our families. I think this type of sacrifice will be reflected in our willingness to give up the comfort of silence for obeying the command to share the gospel, to to live out the gospel in our homes, in our workplaces, at school. I think it will be reflected in our willingness to sacrifice our plans for His plans. I think it will be reflected in a willingness to sacrifice my agenda for His agenda. I think it will be reflected in a willingness to sacrifice the general comfort of the status quo to be willing to say, here I am, I will go. As a church, our expression of treasuring the kingdom of God will be reflected in how obedient we are in expanding the kingdom of God into the kingdom of darkness taking the gospel into a world that desperately needs to hear it. What a message for us. What a challenge for us. I think of what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, 7 through 9, where he said, But whatever was to my profit, I now consider as a loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the, I love the surpassing greatness of Christ Jesus, my Lord, of knowing Him for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage or I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Isn't that powerful? So we see the discovery, the treasure is found. We see the value placed on it, a willingness to sacrifice everything, to possess it, to seek it. And that leaves us with our challenge. And the challenge for us is that we have the kingdom of God. We experience His rule and reign in our hearts and minds. We not only possess the kingdom of God, but we would say the kingdom of God possesses us. We've experienced forgiveness. We've experienced hope. And so the challenge for us as a church especially is because we have experienced the kingdom of God, (coughs) are we willing now to go and share the kingdom of God? So how does that play out in our lives in our church? I think that this truth should do three things. It should move us, it should challenge us, and it should encourage us. First of all, it should move us. These parables, this truth, this call to seek the kingdom and share the kingdom should move us in in this truth, that the kingdom of God is something that must be personally received. This truth should move us and motivate us. In in one sense, every human being is under the dominion of God's kingdom. In, In the sense that if he or she lives on planet earth, then ultimately they are under God's ultimate control. Even though Satan has been given limited and finite and temporary power over this world, it is still under the dominion of God. There are even ways that we can be a blessing to unbelievers. We can meet their needs. We can provide care. We can can meet their immediate needs. But the Bible makes it clear that just because you experience some of the benefits of the kingdom of God, it doesn't mean you are a part of the kingdom of God. The Bible makes it clear from the beginning of this book to the end that The kingdom of God, salvation, reconciliation with God must be done on a personal level. It has to be received personally. 
And my question to you is this. Have you received the kingdom of God? Have you received the salvation and forgiveness of Christ personally? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? It is so easy. One of the great distractions from this call to seek the kingdom of of God is to begin to believe that you are a part of this kingdom because of religious works or maybe because of a title of a religious group you belong to. Maybe you believe that you uh, have inherited the kingdom of God because you've always gone to church and maybe you're a student and your grandfather and your parents all came to this church. Or maybe you think you're a a good person, so certainly you've inherited the kingdom of God. But Jesus reminds us time and time again that entering the kingdom of God, experiencing salvation, is something that must happen personally. And I would challenge you, if you're here this morning, I don't care what your background is, if you grew up in this church, if you're a first-time visitor, if you're a seeker, however you would define yourself, If you have never come to a place where you have personally repented of your sin and placed your faith in Jesus, in his finished work on the cross, then you are in danger of missing the kingdom of God. You may be here and saying, you know what? I believe in Jesus and I also believe that I must do good works. If I believe in Jesus and I'm just a good enough person, then I'm going to be saved. And the reality is, if we add anything, and if you trust anything above the finished work of Jesus on the cross and the resurrection, then you are believing a false gospel, and you are not a part of the kingdom of God. Maybe you're here and you're saying, you know what, I'm religious enough. I believe in Jesus, but I've also gone through this religious rite or ritual. And if you're trusting in religious rites or ritual then you're believing a false gospel. The Bible tells us that faith is faith in Jesus, not of works. It is a gift of God, according to Ephesians chapter 2, so that none of us can boast or brag or say, I did this or I accomplished this. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 8, and we won't take the time to turn there, Jesus addresses the Jewish people who had rejected him. They were a religious group. The Pharisees were a religious bunch. They prided themselves in their good works, in their religion, in their religious title. But Jesus, recognizing they hadn't had a personal exchange of faith, says this. He says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom... And the subjects of the kingdom are the religious people who had not entered into relationship. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is what should move us. That we have a a message of personal faith to share. So this should move us. Number two. We see that the truth of these parables should also challenge us. We should be challenged by this truth that the kingdom of God is something that is not always readily visible. I love these parables because you have two people. One, the man in the field, is it's implied that he wasn't searching for anything, but just found it. The other is a pearl merchant whose entire life was wrapped around trying to find the treasure. And so the man walking in the field, the implication is, in essence, stumbled upon the treasure. It was not something he was searching for, but when he had an encounter with it, it changed his life. The other guy was someone who had been searching for the pearl his whole career. He'd risked his life looking for the thing of value. And finally, after searching and looking, he found it. Both of them show us that the kingdom of God and salvation is not something that is always readily and obvious to a lost and hurting world. And our call then is for us to not only seek the kingdom, 
but then to share the kingdom. This is our challenge to go and to share the gospel as individuals. It's our challenge as a church to be a part of expanding the kingdom of God in our efforts, in our programs, and in our focuses. This is our challenge and this is our call. Romans chapter 10, it's a passage you're very familiar with, says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is why we must always be challenged to stay focused on and passionate about growing the kingdom of God as a church. Our calling is not to grow this church, our own individual empire. It is to look at us as a church as the tool, a tool that God uses to expand His kingdom. And one of our great passions and really our key um, way we do this, <coughs> our key strategy as a church is to do cooperative kingdom work with other gospel-focused, Bible-believing churches. And we do that not only because it's the most effective way to expand His kingdom, Instead of competing with churches in the county, we partner with them because there are so many lost people in this county. We could all fill our buildings ten times over. We're passionate about cooperative kingdom work because it's most effective. But secondly, we're passionate about it because it is a powerful witness to the community. Did you know the lost world is really skeptical about our motivations for doing what we do? Uh, the lost world looks at churches and has questions about our motives, why we do things. And when we cooperate together for kingdom work, I think it's an incredible witness for, for the Lord and His work in people's lives. I want to challenge you this summer. And I want to challenge you, there are three key ways that you can be a part of kingdom work of taking the good news as a church to this community and beyond. Number one is the Sussex Project. We've been talking about the Sussex Project. This is our partnership this year with Milford Bible Church. And we come together as youth groups, as families, as individuals over the course of the week. And it's this year, June 25th through June 29th. And we basically come together as two Bible-believing churches cooperating together. We have 10 projects throughout Sussex County where we go and we do we meet practical needs in people's homes, their yards, their houses. But while we're meeting practical needs, we also build relationships and we share the gospel. And a matter of fact, it's exciting. This year, two of our 10 projects are actually neighbors of LFC members. It's a great opportunity to be the hands and feet of Christ and then share the hope of Christ with them. I want to challenge you. Today is actually the last day for you to turn in your application as an individual or family to be a part of Sussex Serve or the, the Sussex Project. And this year, um, Pastor Brian and Pastor Ryan have done a great job working with those who are leading this to offer more than just one time where you can serve. You can serve in the morning, you can serve in the afternoon, and even in the evenings. So if you can't take time off of work to be a part, you can take some part of your day to be a part of the Sussex Project. This is a great way to be the hands and feet of Christ and to cooperate with another church to expand the kingdom. So if you have questions, you can go to the um, Welcome Center. These are the applications. You can ask Pastor Brian or Pastor Ryan, and they'll be glad to fill you in on those details. The second way you can be a part of kingdom work this summer is through our New Jersey State Fair tent. 
as many of you know, for years we have had a, a big tent in one of the key locations at the state fair. And what we've done over the past several years is we have transitioned the point of being there from promoting LFC to sharing the gospel. A matter of fact, that is our one purpose as we set up the tent and interact with people. It's to share the gospel. And this year we're taking it even a step further. No longer is it going to be the Lafayette Federated Church tent but we're going to be working in conjunction with four other Bible-believing, gospel-focused churches in Sussex County. And so it's going to be a tent promoting the gospel and then offering as a resource connection to four or more local Bible-believing churches. Now, we're still going to, as a church, head up that effort, and we certainly need as many of you who have served in that tent in the past years to step up and serve again. We are going to be offering training at all four of the participating churches. It's going to be a great opportunity not only to be about expanding the kingdom, but doing it cooperatively with other believers. And then finally, number three, the third way I want to challenge you to expand the kingdom this summer is this. I would challenge every one of our small groups from our um, shepherding groups to our Sunday school classes to our Bible study groups to this summer, <clears throat> choose one way that you will cooperatively be a, a, about sharing the gospel in the, in the community. And I would challenge you, every one of you <clears throat> knows someone who's involved in another small group of some type in another Bible-believing, gospel-focused church. And what I want to challenge you, next week when you get together with your shepherding group, somebody step up when you guys are gathered together and say, what are we going to do to cooperate with another group of believers from another church to, to expand the kingdom this summer? Now, you may say, what would we do? Well, can I challenge you? We have on staff a pastor of Kingdom Expansion Ministries, Pastor Brian Ingram. His job, and he is equipped, he has great ideas. He will encourage you. He will give you ideas. He'll help you as a group to figure out a way to, to do meaningful kingdom work cooperatively with another group this summer. Now, when you get together next Sunday in your shepherding group, somebody bring that up, okay? Don't go the whole time. And if somebody says, you're only saying that because Pastor Aaron said you had to, then say, yeah, that's right. That's why I'm doing it. But I encourage you, find a way to, to take up this challenge of being cooperative in our, our kingdom work. And then finally, we're challenged by that. We're moved by these parables. But finally, be encouraged. Be encouraged. And be encouraged by this truth that we seek the kingdom of God and we share the kingdom of God because it is, because He is the only source of true joy. These parables to me are so challenging on one level because both of these talk about the sacrifice that these people made. I mean, they sold everything. That's powerful. But do you know what really convicts me? You know what really moves me? What really makes me check my motivation and my heart? Let me read that first parable again. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then what does it say? In his joy. In his joy. He went and sold all he had and he bought the field. We need to be reminded that we seek the kingdom of God. And we say it's worth sacrificing everything because it's the only source of joy. And we share the kingdom of God because we love people so much that we know they may look more successful than us. They may have a better marriage than us. They may have a bigger bank account than us. They may have a, a, a better job at work than we have. But ultimately, all of that is nothing compared to the joy of Jesus. We spend our entire lives as human beings 
striving and grabbing and bringing things in, hoping that somehow they fill a void or they bring joy or purpose and meaning in life. But those of us who know Jesus know that He is the only source of joy. That everything else is a false, cheap counterfeit. That if we hold on to something other than Jesus, we're ultimately going to find that we're holding on to nothing of value and worth. We share the gospel because we know that the joy that comes for forsaking everything for his sake is worth it. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves. And the word store up means hoard or grab or seek after. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The great challenge is, what are we seeking after for ultimate joy? And if it's anything other than Jesus, it's nothing. It's what must, rust and moth will destroy. It's worthless. Several years ago, Dana was going through a Jennifer Rothschild Bible study, and she shared a quote with me that stuck with me. I wrote it down. It was a big encouragement to me, and I know it's been a big encouragement to Dana as well. It simply says this, Don't forfeit unseen treasures to hold on to seen comforts. Don't forfeit unseen treasures to hold on to seen comforts. We seek and we share because we know that Jesus is the only source of true joy. So as we close this part of the service this morning, I want to ask you three simple questions. Number one, What do you daily seek? What is it that you seek when you wake up in the morning? What is it that motivates you? What is it that moves you? What do you spend your time seeking after? And if it's anything above and more importantly than seeking after a deeper abiding relationship with Jesus, can I tell you, you are seeking after that which rust and moth will destroy. You may be seeking after treasure, but compared to the treasure of Christ, it's worthless. It's like exchanging a a bucket full of pennies when you could have the, the wealth of the national treasury and gold. So what do you daily seek? And can I tell you, if it's not Jesus... Can you make a decision? And I challenge you to make a decision right now to say, I am going to reorient my life to seek Jesus. I'm going to spend more time in the Word. I'm going to spend more time in prayer. I'm going to be willing to ask someone to hold me accountable and help me because I struggle with this sin. You're going to be willing, and I challenge you to perhaps set aside some things like your entertainment choices. They may be awful and evil, or they may just be secondary and silly, but maybe God's calling you to say, I'm willing to set those things aside, that time I spent, that effort I put into it, whatever it is, and I'm going to exchange those cheap things for more time with Jesus, more focus on Him. So what do you daily seek? Number two, are you on mission? Are you on mission? What are you doing to expand the kingdom of God? What are you doing to expand the kingdom of God in your family as moms or dads or or grandparents? What are you doing to expand the kingdom of God at school, in the classroom, in the lunchroom, in the halls? What are you doing to expand the kingdom of God in your neighborhood? What are you doing to expand the kingdom of God through the work and the ministries of the church? 
How can you get on board and get on mission as you seek the kingdom of God to share the kingdom of God? And then finally, I would just ask you this. This is very personal because these parables speak to me very personally. And the question is this, is your true joy in Jesus? Is your true joy in Jesus? Is Jesus the prize of your life? Is knowing Him, serving Him, obeying Him, is that the true joy in your life? Or is it secondary or tertiary? Is it fourth on the list? Is it fifth on the list? Can I tell you there is nothing wrong with pursuing um, excellence at your job. There is nothing wrong with pursuing academic excellence. There's nothing wrong with seeking those things, but all of those things that we try to find joy and purpose and meaning in, if they trump the the seeking of joy in Jesus, then we have missed everything. We've missed everything. So is Jesus your true joy? We want to close this part of the service by singing a song of response. And during this song of response, I would invite you to do some serious searching in your heart. First of all, if you realize you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would challenge you even now to pray and to receive Him. If you've been depending on anything other than Jesus and His work on the cross, would you, right where you're at, would you pray? Would you repent from your sin? And would you place your faith in Him? Maybe you want to do that right where you're at. Maybe you would like to come forward and have one of the pastors pray with you. We would love to do that. Maybe you're here and you need to make a commitment to be on mission for Him. And again, maybe that's a commitment you need to make right where you're at, or maybe this front part is open and you want to come and get down on your knees and pray and ask God for for help and direction and guidance. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do in response to seeking His kingdom, would you be obedient today?